I'll call to order the Collatane County Board of Supervisors meeting for April 6, 2015. Mr. Tucker, if you'll leave us in the pledge, and I'll leave us in the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Lord, thank you for such a beautiful day in Powhatan County. Thanks for all the people who come out tonight to speak. Help us listen with open ears as we seek to do the people's business. Amen. <laughs> Mr. Can we have a moment of silence? Uh, Mr. Norvig has asked that we have a moment of silence for the tragedy that took place in, in uh, Old Waffle Walker's Ferry Road. Thank you. Do you have any requests to postpone, delete, or add any items or change the order of the presentation of the agenda? Move that we would. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 At this time, we'll move to certificates of appreciation, special resolution, and proclamation. First one we'll have is Proclamation 2015 3, Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. Mr. Tucker's going to take this one. This is a proclamation basically designating the month of April 2015 as Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. Whereas every child is a unique gift full of promise and potential, and whereas child abuse and neglect are serious problems in Virginia and across the nation, and whereas prevention of child abuse is a critical to the preservation of the health and well-being of Virginia's families and can be accomplished by providing support and information to families as well as through increased community awareness. And whereas all children learn from role models at home, at school, and in their communities, and all children benefit from the love and leadership displayed by caring and responsible adults, and whereas children are our most precious resource and we are committed to keeping the children of Virginia safe and happy and whereas Powhatan County spread awareness on March 28, 2015 at Powhatan's Pinwheel Picnic to celebrate the youth in their community and to reinforce the need to strengthen families. Now, for their, now therefore be it proclaimed that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors recognize April 2015 as Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month, supports the efforts and the mission of the Powhatan Department of Social Services in playing an active role to prevent child abuse, and calls this important issue to the attention of Powhatan citizens and residents. Adopted this day, April the 6th, 2015. Mr. Chairman, that's a motion. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Tucker, and thank you, Board. Um, this is probably the most important thing we do at the Department of Social Services, and we always appreciate and value your support. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments? At this time, we'll have our second proclamation, and that is 2015-04, April 1st through the 7th, 2015, as Local Government Education Week in Virginia. And, and I, I'm going to read that just so it's on the record. It says, Proclamation April 1st through 7th, 2015, as Local Government Education Week, whereas this, since the co colonial period, the Commonwealth of Virginia has closely held the institutions of the local government, and whereas local governments throughout the Commonwealth provide valuable service to the citizens of the community they serve, and whereas citizens such as law enforcement, public health, and safety, rec recreational opportunities, and educating local children are most delivered at the local level. And whereas, in recognition of the work performed by local government, the Virginia General Assembly on February 29, 2012, designated the first week of April as Local Government Education Week in Virginia. Now, therefore, it be proclaimed by the Powhatan Court Powhatan County Board of Supervisors that April 1st through the 7th, 2015 is hereby designated as Local Government Education Week. Be it further proclaimed that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors and the Powhatan County School Board will partner to promote civic education 
and engagement in an effort to educate citizens about their local government, strengthen the sense of community, and engage the next generation of local government managers. Adopted by the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors on April 6, 2015. That's in the form of a motion. Can I get a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Norvig is going to take your next proclamation. It's uh, Proclamation 2015-05, National Public Safety Telecommunication Week. <coughs> and uh, I guess, the, can we get the uh, dispatchers to come on down? Boy, this, personally, this is a real pleasure for me. I, um, I'm big on public safety, and, and this is fun. I thank Mr. Chairman, I thank you for letting me do this one. Uh, we're recognizing the telecommunicators of the Powhatan County Sheriff's Office 911 Center. This is a proclamation, whereas emergencies can occur at any moment, day or night, across Powhatan County, and whereas the prompt response of deputies, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property, and whereas the safety of our deputies, firefighters, and emergency medical personnel is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the Powhatan County Emergency Communications Center, and whereas the public safety dispatchers of the Powhatan County Sheriff's Office are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with emergency services and serve as the single vital link for our deputies, firefighters, and emergency services personnel by monitoring their activities by radio, providing them information, and ensuring their safety, and whereas the public safety dispatchers have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, rescue of trapped victims, and treatment of injured or ill patients, and whereas each public safety dispatcher has exhibited compassion, understanding, and professionalism during the performance of their duties over the past year. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors that April 12th through 18th, 2015, is National Public Safety Telecommunications, Telecommunicators Week in Powhatan County, and the Board of Supervisors recognizes the telecommunicators of the Powhatan County Sheriff's Office 911 Center for their exemplary and critical service to the citizens and staff of Powhatan County. Adopted by the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors, April 6, 2015. Congratulations. This is a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 One quick comment. Um, thank you all for what you all do. Uh, you all are behind the scenes. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for what you all do. You all are behind the scenes people who do a tremendous job. As Billy Gwynn, Mr. Beach, Mr. Holy, and others have reminded me, the only as good as the information you get from the, from the dispatch center. So thank you for what you all do. Mr. Chairman, one more. Go ahead, Mr. Talker. Just, just as with the... <laughs> Just as with the words that we did for child abuse prevention, these are not just words. We are aware of what you do day in and day out, just like we are the people in social services. I, too, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have anything you want to say, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> you got the mic. As uh, Supervisor Norvig said, they are a vital link. Um, day in, day out. These are the people that have to remain calm when everybody else isn't. And uh, uh, they're a credit to uh, the profession. And I appreciate the board taking the time to do the proclamation for them. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to our last proclamation, 2015 06 Earth Day. And Mr. Williams is going to take this with Betty McCracken from the Earth Day Committee, Sister Jean Ryan, Dan Jones, and Winfrey Taylor. Please come forward. If I missed anybody, please let me know.
Hey, Dan, how you doing? Good, Good seeing you. Mr. Chairman, this is a proclamation for a recognition of Earth Day, <clears throat> April 22nd, 2015. Whereas a healthy environment is necessary for a thriving community, a vigorous economy, and our citizens' well-being, and whereas as responsible citizens, we all have a duty of caring for and improving our environment both locally and globally. And whereas Powhatan County <clears throat> and its residents take pride in the actions we have carried out to protect the natural beauty of our county through responsible stewardship, a strong anti-litter program, an annual clean business award, and a and protection of our riparian areas, and Whereas it is also realized that much remains to be done and that county government, civic business groups, and our citizenry can and must be more aggressive in addressing environmental and quality of life issues. And whereas Powhatan County <coughs> takes pride in its long heritage and prospects for a continuous, continued prosperous future, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors does hereby recognize April 22nd, 2015 as Earth Day and urges all citizens to join in the Powhatan County Earth Day celebration on Tuesday, April 22nd at the Cortez Green in the village of Powhatan from 4 p.m. until 7 p.m. Be it further proclaimed that Powhatan County Board of Supervisors commends the hard work and dedication of the local Earth Day Coalition comprised of the Powhatan County Anti-Litter Council, Virginia Cooperative Extension, pa uh, Powhatan Office, Powhatan Chamber of Commerce, Powhatan County Public Schools, Monacan Soil and Water Conservation District, Powhatan Tomorrow, St. Francis, St. Emma, the Women's Club of Powhatan County, in Capital Region Conservancy and request all county departments and citizens to join these organizations in recognizing the importance of a healthy environment and committing to taking positive and visible measures to protect and improve our environment and in helping to educate others to do the same. Be it further proclaimed that the Powhatan County commits to the support of programs that further improve the lives of citizens in the natural environment in which we live and work and challenges each citizen to take an active part in this effort. Adopted by the County Board of Supervisors on April 6, 2015. Mr. Chairman, I make the motion. Second. Approved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Absolutely. I, uh, especially, I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for your support of this, our ninth year. And uh, a special thanks to Pat Weiler and her staff. And uh, Pat has been very supportive since day one. Thank you, Pat. Thanks to each other. Thank you, Ms. McCracken, Sister Ryan. Thank you, David. At this time, we'll have a pub, our first of two public comment periods. Uh, limit your comments to three minutes per individual or five minutes per group. And this is make sure we speak for anything that's not on, not to be addressed later. So if we have something that will be addressed in the, in the uh, packet later, and it's on a, a public hearing, then you'll get a chance to speak at that time. So please come forward at this time. Seeing no one, I'll close the public comment period. Can we, but we see the consent agenda. Can we make get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Print? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Move on to item number nine. Point points to boards and commissions and committees. Ms. Weiler. This is for the board. Okay, Mr. Sorry. Chairman, I ask that we defer the appointments to the Economic Development Authority. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we go to the Extension Leadership Councils on page 80 of your packet. And I, there is a motion there. Once I can get to it, please. Um, I recommend we nominate Brad Nunley to the Extension Leadership Council. Uh, I think Brad would make a great addition to that. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 
So we go on to the next appointment. We elaborate Board of Trustee. That's also an opening that was created, unfortunately, with the passing of Ravina Vaughn. Mr. Shulkers has been gracious enough to uh, turn his name in and, and agree to serve. So I'll nominate Mr. Shulkers for the for the Library Board of Trustees. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. At this time, I'm, we still have one opening on the Powhatan Community, Community Action Agency Advisory Board. Mr. Chairman, as a result of the passing of the Emergency Services Coordinator, Ms. Vaughn, uh, the Social Service Department will be going through a reevaluation, as we always do, about what CAA should be about and what the thrust of it might be. So I'm going to ask that we defer this until such a time that we reconstitute the CAA Advisory Board against its new mission. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. We'll move on to <coughs> item 10. Our first a public hearing. We'll have a public hearing on Ordinance 2015-04, amending Chapter 46, Article 1 of the Fire, Fire Department, Code of Powhatan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item is found on page 93 of your agenda. The board discussed this at their February 24th workshop. We do have before you a public hearing on the item. You will find in your agenda packet the advertisement in the newspaper as required by the Virginia Code. In addition to that, Chief Singer is going to do a PowerPoint presentation, and you have in front of you at the dais a copy of that PowerPoint presentation. With that, I'm going to turn it over to the Chief. Chairman Mellon, board members, uh, public here today. Uh, tonight we're talking about uh, changes to the county code as reflects to the uh, fire and rescue department. Uh, and what I'm going to do is just a brief overview. If you have any specific code questions, we can uh, address those also. But this ordinance is uh, used to revise the provisions related to the formation and composition of the fire and rescue department, its responsibilities, and the authorities of the fire and rescue chief. Currently, the emergency services here in the county are broken up into several different organizations. Firstly, you have the Powhatan County Fire Administration Office, <coughs> which also houses the uh, Department of Emergency Management. Then you have the Powhatan County Fire Department, which is technically a nonprofit association of our five volunteer fire departments in one group organization. And then lastly, we have the volunteer, uh, Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad. So you basically have several different entities that we're bringing together under one umbrella administration, the fire departments, the rescue squad, and emergency management, bringing them all together under one entity known as the Powhatan County Fire and Rescue Department. <clears throat> the composition of the department we made up of the officials and staff of the department uh, county-wise and also the following volunteer fire companies and rescue squads, which are an integral part of the official safety program of the county. That includes the Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad, the Powhatan Volunteer Fire Department, Huguenot Volunteer Fire Department, Macon District Volunteer Fire Department, Fine Creek Volunteer Fire Department, and the Deep Creek Volunteer Fire Department. Overall, the department shall be responsible for regulating and managing provisions of all pre-hospital emergency patient care and medical services, regulating and managing the provisions of fire prevention, protection, investigation, and suppression, which pose a threat to life and property, and also to assist those companies and the departments generally as an administrative office so that the fire and rescue personnel, mostly volunteers, can concentrate their attention on emergency response. Duties of the fire and rescue chief to provide general management of the department overall, establish and enforce department regulations, control of station operations related to the provision of fire and rescue services, to hire, appoint, and terminate officers, staff, and volunteers of the department, provide general management, planning, preparation, and response for disasters throughout the county, and also take actions on behalf of the county administrator necessary to implement and carry out terms of agreement such as mutual aid, disaster preparedness, and other provision of services. And this is mostly when we're talking about uh, going into a declaration of emergency. In other words, when you make a declaration of emergency, I have powers through the county administrator to do what we need to do to take care of that emergency. Helping with the uh, formation and with setting policy, we've developed a senior policy group the Fire and Rescue Senior Policy Group shall consist of the district or EMS chief from each of those recognized organized volunteer companies and one career fire rescue employee appointed by the county fire chief. And senior policy groups shall be consulted prior to any issuance of any regulations or policies. So that in a nutshell is bringing all the, uh, all the groups together. If you have any questions specifically about an uh, individual portion of the uh, 
code, let me know, and I can certainly answer those for you. Any questions, staff, at this time? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Wheel. Chief, with the configuration that you've just put forward, with the four blocks showing the relationship to each other, with, in essence, the county over top of it, how does that work in Chesterfield with the volunteer rescue squads that they have? Because I think they got, what, four or five in Chesterfield? That's correct. How are they organized, and what is their command structure over in Chesterfield? I would have to research that for you, sir. Because I've had friends <clears throat> that served in volunteer rescue squads like in Manchester and in Forest View, mm -hmm. and they seem to have a semi-autonomous relationship to the government in Chesterfield County. Is this, and you said you didn't know, but I, that, that's a question I think is important. How have, you know, I've, I've watched Chesterfield evolve over my lifetime, which mm -hmm. is a considerable period of time. It seems to work over there. Whatever they got, it seems to work. Right. And the discussion we had last week um, when you asked me about the billing stuff, um, that is correct that they, when they bill, those funds go back directly to that individual rescue squad. But that is not going to be a problem here because those, those funds come back in to get held by the county and specifically go towards the staffing of, of rescue and the buying of the <coughs> things that the rescue squad needs. When you came on board, one of the recommendations that you made to us and you said you were going to do, and we, we supported, and that was to do a study through the state. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Where do we stand with that study? I was contacted over the past month uh, and uh, gathered information for the state. Uh, it's been passed on to them, and I, in fact, got some emails today where hopefully in next week or the week after they'll be starting uh, conversations, both having um, teleconference with me to start with, and then they'll be coming to actually indiv uh, individually talk to each of the uh, departments and gather more information for those studies. Does that study of findings, do you anticipate have any bearing on what you're proposing for us to adopt in the ordinance tonight? This ordinance, no. I think um, actually the study will be in favor of bringing all the organizations together just like this. If you read some of the other studies that have been done recently, no. right. it, they, they usually recommend to bring everything under control so they're, they're all, all the agencies are working together under one entity <coughs> with, with common operating procedures and so forth. Well, that, that's the state making those recommendations. I understand why, why the state does that. But what I'm interested in looking at is not just what the state recommends, but that's important to me, but also how it works in other localities and how it's evolved, particularly in Chesterfield. I would be interested in knowing that. Okay. Um, in terms of your authority, do you have the, under this proposed change, would you have the ability to remove officers in any of the volunteer organizations? I would have authority to remove members from serving, yes. Um, I know that is an ultimate power, but it's an ultimate power that is needed in the position that I'm in. Um, but I guess the question goes, goes twofold. Um, as we move forward and develop standards for training and standards for people to hold the positions that they're in, uh, in other organizations that I've been a member of, you might hold the rank of a certain rank, but not operationally in the field. So a person may be a chief officer, but not necessarily a chief officer in the field, if you understand what I mean. What I'm, what I'm getting at, if, if I was the president, for example, of, of one of the fire companies, for instance, not the chief, but the president or something like that, would you have the authority? Corporate officers, no, sir, under, under the uh, State uh, Employment Commission, uh, or, um, I'm sorry, what's the word? I understand what SEC. No, I would not, under the SEC and their corporation, I would not be able to remove any of their, uh, their bylaw officers that way, no. Okay. Don't go anywhere. I might have more questions okay. later on, but thank you, Chief. No problem. <clears throat> Mr. Norby. Um, Chief, we've been over this before. I just wanted to um, reiterate it for the benefit of people sitting here and also anybody that wants to jump into the archives and, and listen to the proceedings. Um, we have a long tradition in Powhatan of volunteer service. Um, we have a great group of people out here. They give their time, energy, they literally risk their lives, and they even put forth money. Um, this is a volunteer culture that has always had a say in some way mm -hmm. in what's going on. Mm -hmm. the, the good thing I see with doing this with a department is it's very efficient. There's no question about it. Efficiency is, is much greater. 
Um, and that's, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Um, it also <coughs> opens itself up to abuse because there's more power toward the top and I am not in any way accusing or hinting. You know we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. But for the record, could you just tell me how are you going to incorporate that tradition of input and a voice of the volunteers, if right. you will? As it should on one side there, our senior policy group is made up of the chief officer of each one of the volunteer fire departments. We meet at least monthly. Uh, this month we're actually meeting twice. And there we discuss policies that are coming forth, policies on the table. It's not a, this is what we're doing. It's a collective of talking back and forth and coming up with the best policy for all the departments involved. It might be good for a fire department, not necessarily good for this one, depending on, you know, this one's more rural and this one's more here and runs more calls. So we talk about those policies as they come forward. It's not necessarily being dictated. So all, like I said, all those policies come forward to the senior policy group before any type of policy is being implemented at all. So if I'm a, a second year volunteer and I'm not a chief or anything like that, I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, just a normal volunteer, not just, that's, that. I don't mean to say it that way. <laughs> that's fine. They are, you know, um, given their all as a volunteer and they're fairly new, mm -hmm. do they get, uh, their voice is heard through? Their, their, the, chief, their chief officer is their representative, so normally what happens is a policy would come out, and this is, we've already done this uh, with policies that come out. Policies come out, the chiefs, we talk about them there, then the chiefs actually take them back to their departments, get input from the departments, take it to them in a company meeting, bring that information back together at the next meeting, and we reform the policy again. And if it needs to go on for another month, we, we reform it a little more till we get a policy that's good for everyone. And that's what we've been doing so far. We've only put out two policies, I believe, have, have fully gone through the, through the vetting process like that so far. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Norvig. Any other questions of staff at this time? None at this time. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. I'm going to get there. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the amount of time. Stay on. We're going to have a public <laughs> hearing. Uh, Ordinance 2015 04, amending Chapter 46, Article uh, 1 of the Fire Code for Powhatan County. Anybody wishing to come forward and speak, please come forward at this time. Members of the board, my name is Alan Beach. I live at 2002 Buckingham Forest Court. I'm here as the uh, chief officer of the rescue squad, <clears throat> so bear with me. Members of the board, since our beginning in 1956, Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad's mission has always been to help the citizens of Powhatan County by supplying a much needed service. To date, our goal is to do just that by supplying the only emergency EMS transport service in the county. I would like to take an opportunity to remind all the board members that in February of 2012, under your direction to the county administrator, we were asked to work with the county of Powhatan to begin billing for EMS transport service. As it was explained, this would help defray the cost, the, the, county's part of the cost to provide EMS transport service to the citizens of Powhatan. This money was to be set aside in a fund to cover 100% of the cost of daytime contract providers, cost of the billing company fees, leftover funds would be to cover the cost of capital, facility, vehicle, equipment, supply costs, and professional services. The rescue squad felt this request would help the county and the citizens we did not hesitate to meet the challenge head on. Since we began fee for service, July 1 of 2012, Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad has strived to manage the task to complete all patient care reports and make available to the billing company those completed files weekly so each transport trip would be billed at the highest rate allowable by Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance companies. We also served as liaisons of the county to explain to the citizens that contacted us or made inquiries while they were now receiving a bill for service. Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad has worked with the county of Powhatan for many years, and we as an organization have explored many revenue sources available applying for grants and using donated money to upgrade or purchase ambulance units and or purchase vital new equipment to better serve and care for the citizens while, while protecting 
the health of our volunteers. Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad over the past five years has applied and received grants for the purchase of two new ambulance units, plus refurbished three ambulance units that were owned by PBRS, 10 ECG monitor defibrillators, seven power cot stretchers, 10 laptops for the training center, 14 laptops for ambulance units to input patient information to be uploaded to the state office of EMS and the billing company, and the cost of training 10 EMTIs at J. Sergeant Reynolds, <clears throat> totaling $978,000, 987, I'm sorry, $978,084.70, of which the cost to the county was $233,447.50, a 75% savings to the county. If you calculate the number of hours that the Rescue Squad volunteers gave to the county in calendar year 2014 alone, using information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, an estimate pay rate plus benefits plus LOTA for paid employees would equal half a million dollars. The actual cost to the county for the volunteers was $16,425 which covers the cost of the LOTA. This equals to a savings for the county of $487,833.84, a 96% savings to the county. An estimate for the previous four years gross pay plus benefits equals $1.4 million. The cost, the total cost of equipment, training, plus the estimated labor cost of hours provided to the county by Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad organization over the past five years equals a total estimate savings to the county of $2.9 million. It is the opinion of Powhatan Violent Rescue Squad as we make every attempt to be good stewards of the county's and the citizens' money. We are not sure why there was a request for additional paid hours for staffing in the fire office to do a job that is currently being done by Powhatan Violent Res Volunteer Rescue Squad leadership at no cost to the county. According to the county's advertisement for employment to hire a county fire chief, this person would be tasked to promote volunteer involvement and membership to support the volunteer system by proactively supporting activities that will promote the viability of volunteer services and to include volunteer recruitment and retention. In conversations between Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad members and the new fire chief, he has made it clear that his intentions are that emergency ambulance units in Powhatan will be operated by paid county employees. To one member, he even asked if there was any interest in separating from Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad organization to start another rescue squad from our station in the western end of the county. Mr. Beach. It is becoming very apparent to me and quite a few of my colleagues that volunteer in both the rescue squad and the fire companies that the intent of the fire chief to cooperate with the volunteers to improve this system is not the case. Alan, can we just make sure we're not personally attacking anybody you want to speak broad based? That's okay, but, you know. Okay. Thank you. I have listened at your board meetings and heard information you were told that we are deficient in level of care that we supply to the citizens. But with this not, what was not shared is under the direction of our operational medical director, Dr. Joanne Lapatina allows the EMT basics of Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad to perform skills above the standard EMT B providers are allowed in the Odemsa region, which includes the following, intranasal glucagon for unconscious diabetic patients, intranasal Narcan for unconscious patients of unknown reason or suspected drug overdose, albuterol nebulizer breathing treatments for patients having breathing problems such as asthma, CPAP for patients that suffer from lung illnesses such as COPD or CHF, EpiPen auto injectors for both adult and children suffering from anaphylaxis reactions, administration of aspirin and acquisition of 12 lead ECG for patients having chest pains and suspected to having cardiac event. Dr. Lapatina gives of her time for free and also serves as the OMD for the Powhatan Fire Department, the Sheriff's Department SWAT team medics, and dispatch as needed for the EMD program. This in comparison to her counterpart with Chesterfield County Fire EMS, 
that has a full-time OMD at a cost of $216,000 per year. Some of you may not know what ODEMSA is. ODEMSA is one of 11 regional EMS councils mandated by the state code in the Commonwealth serving the planning districts of 13, 14, 15, and 19. One of the many tasks that they perform is to write regional protocols establishing guidelines between EMS administrators, EMS provider, medical direction for management, treatment, and transport of specific <coughs> medical emergencies. We are all EMS agents. We, as all EMS agencies, are also mandated by Virginia State Code to follow the regulations of the State Board of Health through the State Office of EMS. I recently spoke to a longtime friend of mine who serves in the leadership role at a rescue squad organization in Chesterfield County, to which Chesterfield has four independently licensed EMS agencies that are separate from Chesterfield Fire and EMS Department. These agencies maintain their own identity and are agents and have agency number with the Office of EMS while working with Chesterfield County to supply EMS transport service. Each rescue squad receives from Chesterfield County the money collected from the transports that their organization completes minus an administration fee for the building company. They also receive a county, a county contribution for operational needs. Powhatan Rescue Squad is asking that the Board of Supervisors postpone the proposed county code changes in Chapter 46 until after the study is complete. Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad would like to request an opportunity to have input and the wording of any new proposed code changes. We would also like to know why the proposed name change of the fire department and the title of the fire chief. It was just changed two years ago at the department level and has been changed to include, why it's being changed to include the word rescue. This will only confuse citizens when we send out fund drive letters to who we will continue to ask for their generous donations to continue our service. We have no problem working with Powhatan Fire Department to improve combined EMS service to the citizens of Powhatan. We would, like, we would ask under the allowance within the State Code of Virginia as a licensed EMS agency chartered by the County of Powhatan to remain a separate operating EMS agency in the county and to continue to raise funding while assisting the County of Powhatan to give the citizens the best emergency EMS service as we can have for the past 59 continuous years. <clears throat> I will close with this following excerpt from the Virginia Office of EMS website. Virginia Emergency Medical Services System was built on volunteer support. Volunteer EMS professionals armed with the latest knowledge and the best equipment, these volunteers help to save lives each year. Respectfully submitted on behalf of the dedicated members of Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad Incorporated. Thank you, Mr. Beach. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to come forward and speak, please do so at this time. Members of the board, members of the public, thank you for your time. My name is Jason. I'm a member of the Powhatan County Rescue Squad. What's your last name, sir? Last name is Cox, C-O-X. Um, after viewing the uh, PowerPoint presentation placed forth by the fire and rescue chief of Powhatan County, I understand that it gives a general idea of what's been proposed in this document, but it only kind of touched on the surface. The document that we received was 22 pages in total, and at our last membership meeting, we were tasked with reading this line by line so that we could address specific concerns. Uh, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to look it over. Uh, there are a few specific concerns that were not addressed by Chief Beach that I'd like to discuss with you at this time. Uh, specifically, Section D, Policy, uh, which defines the authority of the County Fire and Rescue Chief. It says that the County Fire and Rescue Chief shall have the authority to promulgate standard operative procedures and policies both operational and administrative. Fire and Rescue Chief shall provide sufficient time as defined in this policy from input from the fire senior policy group prior to issuance of any regulations or policies related to fire or emergency operations required by 
section 46.9 of the Powhatan County Code. However, in section 3.2, it says, no policy, general order, or interim medical directive of the department shall be enacted without the approval of the Fire and County Rescue Chief. I'm going to stop there to identify something here. Um, ROMD, Ms. Lapatina, uh, as a doctor and generously doting not only her time but her medical license, is who we as a department operate directly under. We derive our authority and our ability to practice medicine as emergency personnel directly from her. And that's a state level authority. Um, an interim medical directive is something that she would give to us telling us that we need to identify, change, enhance, or otherwise modify how we practice in the county. Now saying that no interim medical directive shall be enacted without the approval of the local or municipal government level is a conflict. We already have state level and our OMD giving us that authority to conflict that with a local or lower level of government would cause issues in our ability to practice medicine and therefore serve the public. So that's a specific concern that I have. Um, once signed, the original document in the file will be available for viewing. And I'll only recognize that it's an official policy, general order, or interim medical directive after approved by the Fire and Rescue Chief. So again, I, I do have a problem with that, and I hope you do too. Um, after that, uh, in Section 6, Procedure, states that any member or organization within the Powhatan County Fire and Rescue Department may submit suggestions for policies or suggested changes to existing policies by submitting to the department review and approval form provided in Appendix A of this policy, uh, which I'm going to print out and put this also in writing for you to address my concerns. Since I still have this voice right now, I'd like to say that Section 6.2.4, in the interest of the health, safety, and welfare of the department and or the continuity of operations of the department, the Fire and Rescue Chief may enact any policy. I'm going to read that again. Any policy. As a general order, without submitting it to the senior policy group or membership for review in the comment period, which right now we have. We have a 14-day period to evaluate, discuss this with our membership. The senior policy group then takes that to you and to the Fire and Rescue Chief for review. Um, but in the interest of health, safety, and welfare and or the continuity of operations <clears throat> is a pretty broad and sweeping term. I really can't think of anything that wouldn't fall into health, safety, welfare, or continuation of operations, which, as we mentioned before, does allow for the opening of a very top-heavy power structure. And I don't see the need for it, not at this time, and I don't see that it would ever be necessary. The members of the senior policy group are elected officials by each department from the membership. We value their voices and their time, especially since we're all doing this for free. So we'd love for those voices to continue to be heard. And I'd like to continue to have a voice as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Anyone else wishing to come forward, please come forward at this time. Chairman and board members, my name is Dave Bailey. I live at 1039 Timber Trace Road in District 2. And I just wanted to address Mr. Williams' uh, Concern. I, I worked for Chesterfield Fire Department for 35 years, and um, for the first many, many years, it was just for Chesterfield Fire Department. For the, um, I don't know how many, and the end, near the end of that, it was Chesterfield Fire and EMS, as we really did come together in a unified, uh, unified department with all of the, all of the, uh, the, obviously the fire department and all of the, the four rescue squads. And just want to say that, uh, from my experience both in the field, in field positions and operations, and also in uh, the several staff positions that I worked, it was much more efficient, it was, as was already discussed. And also, uh, in reality, it, the ability to serve the citizens was greatly enhanced once we became a unified department. I do want to thank uh, Chief Beach and, and all of his people, because they, they have done for many, many years and continue to do a tremendous job. But uh, again, in my opinion, we'd be better served as a unified department. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Go ahead. Thank you. 
David, what do you mean by a unified department? Well, one under one unified umbrella with uh, you know input from all of the departments. I started as a volunteer. I actually was a volunteer uh, with Chief Beach in the squad for a little while. I was a volunteer in Chesterfield County for, for several years. And like I said, I was a career firefighter and uh, up through the rank of battalion chief uh, for 35 years in the department. And under one, one unified umbrella, I can't remember exactly how the statute reads now, but I do know that um, Chesterfield has very good models for sharing. As one example, uh, Manchester 1 is now Manchester 1 and, fi and Fire Station 24, which was in my battalion when I retired. And during that time frame, uh, last five years, we were able to integrate. Uh, the county actually put a million dollars into building onto that, onto that uh, facility. Uh, we have a 50-year lease is what we signed, I believe, instead of taking over anything. And we work, <coughs> work extremely well together that's, to that's serve what, the citizens. Right. That, that's why I'm getting at it, David. It would be helpful for me to be able to see what are those policies, right. <clears throat> how does it actually work, because right now what I'm seeing is a proposed ordinance change and uh, a matrix that's showing basically the county over top of all this. What I'm looking for is how does it work in Chesterfield? What are the dotted lines? How does it work? The chain of command, the sharing, the specificity that goes along with sure. those things. And, and, and truly that has evolved. Um, oh, I'm sure it has. Yeah, I mean, it has evolved to the fact that the <clears throat> OMD that was mentioned is now the OMD for, I believe, all the squads, but I, I'm not sure. I know at least part of them. The billing, uh, initially the squads did not bill. I mean, there was no heavy hand there, if, if that makes any sense. Both with the fire department and with the rescue squads, there was never a, he a heavy hand for coming in. It was always, it was always focused on cooperation between the leadership Absolutely. for what was best for the citizens. Uh, so, but, but we can get you those statutes if that's specifically what you're looking uh, for. Yeah, you know, I'd like to see the statute and <clears throat> as, as well as the organizational you know, structure, you know, matrix showing, you know, actually how you do work. If you have a unified structure, what is that unified structure and where does the government come in play in Chesterfield County in that unified structure? Sure. That's, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. I understand. For. I do know practicality-wise that the, that the um, rescue squad's presidents and, uh, and operational chiefs would meet directly with the with the deputy chief of operations. So uh, even the even the battalion chiefs weren't over top of the of the squad. But but we can get you those structures, obviously. Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. And David, you make a good point. This thing evolved over a great number of years, didn't it? Yes, but it 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 was incremental steps, similar was, to what we're looking at now. It was incremental steps, but. I can remember back in the 60s, even in the 50s, how strong those rescue squads were and <clears throat> the amount of volunteerism that was put forward through, I know Forest View, for example, I'm familiar with that, I know some of the people who served as president. Same with Manchester, you know, when it was over there on Route 10, I'm assuming right. it's still there. And I'm sure it's changed a lot since I, I remember it. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, lot of changes. It's a lot not of a, good people. Not a Route 10 anymore. A lot of good people <laughs> came through. Oh, that. Absolutely. We worked. And we worked very well, you know, for many, many years. There's always bumps and rooms for improvement, you know, and opportunities in any type of transition, but that's, that's where we're at. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Mr. Bailey, one quick follow-up. <clears throat> so what you were saying, the ordinance was passed in the county and then it evolved itself over the implementation of it? That's what I believe, yes, sir, but Thank we'll you. have to get you that ordinance. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to come forward, please do so at this time. Good evening. I'm Floyd Green, 2047 Hancock Road, and I'm speaking representing no one but myself. Um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a general statement, I support the ordinance that's bef before you. Do I support every word, every sentence, every paragraph in it? No, I don't. I mean, and I think, and I'll come back to that in just a second. But to give you a bit of background, first off, I've never been a member of the rescue squad. I just have not had the time. I just plain and simply have not the time. I have spent 45 years as a member of the Huguenot Volunteer Fire Department. Been there since the beginning of it. I was fortunate enough to get hired by a local uh, department in the, in the in the region. Spent 32 years <laughs> there, uh, employed and paid for my kids' college's uh, education while I was there. But all the time, my heart was here in volunteers and services here in Powhatan. I was able to get. I was in 1974 first got my EMT, so between my career service and the volunteer service here in the county, I've been involved with EMS assistance, EMS providing uh, for basically my whole uh, life in the 
in the in the fire service here in the county. I was able during my tenure. I was also served as the first treasurer, secretary treasurer of the regional fire association here in the county. Excuse me, second, uh, and then also the second fire chief for the county. Spent in that role for ten years, um, and I was able to during, through that role. I was able to serve as the um, President of the Virginia Fire Chiefs Association, and also was on a governor's appointed board for eight years, only overseeing the Department of Fire programs. Through all that, I've seen a lot of transitions, seen a lot of places change, a lot of places go from career, from, excuse me, from volunteer service to career service, both on the fire and the EMS side. So what I want to just pass on to you, you folks is we're not unused, we're not unique here. The concerns, some of the concerns expressed here the same things happened in Dinwiddie, Prince George, Duke Kent, Hanover, Henrico, Chesterfield. Those are all things that, that, that don't, don't feel we're alone. It has happened to other places. But in all places, they evolved to a central organization that had oversight, had had over all of the services that are being provided in the county, in, in, their, in their communities. Primarily because, again, it it's behooves the county to make sure that the same service is being provided at point A in the county as B in the county. That all of us get the same amount of service. That all of the, the same equipment, the people, the personnel, the training, all of that is on even keel so that, that all of our citizens are, are treated fairly and equally and, and it's overall looked at the overall needs of our, of our county. Um, there are three things that I'd just like to point out to you specifically to, to our county that kind of relate to this, and I'm sure some of these you're going to say, what? First thing I want to talk about, again, is, the, is that fire association. When we first came about with the fire association many years ago, there was two companies in the county, the courthouse company and the Huguenot company. At the time, they were not good relationships between the two companies. That ended up with those members of those companies coming to the Board of Supervisors basically settling, trying to settle their battles with the Board of Supervisors, both for operation things and also mainly money. Saying, well, they got this, we need money for this, and they got that. And the Board of Supervisors actually said, to settle this, we're going to create the Fire Association, which was originally was a member of the Board of Supervisors, citizen appointees on it, and then actually the fire companies had a minor role on that. Which, had, again, that evolved into the later fire association with the chief's association and, and into the, the fire side of the department. But way back when it started, there was gloom and doom predicted by members of the fire company, those two fire companies, and later the company in Macon. Oh, no, this is going to oversight. We're going we're to have to follow their rules. We're going to have to. Well, it worked out. And again, it, it, it became and it, and it worked out. So, again, there's a precedence there. Same kind of thing with recreation and parks. How many years, decades? was recreation and parks out here all done by all volunteers, but that as things went along, there, there needed to be oversight on a, on, a, on a county level for that. And last thing, um, third thing I'd like to talk about would, would cover is the zoning ordinance and the comprehensive plan. You say, well, what's this have to do with it? Well, how many years did it take to do this uh, zoning ordinance and, and comprehensive plan? And you finally got through it, you get to the end, and we're done what's on the agenda tomorrow night but an amendment to the zoning ordinance because again you've adopted something by the board and then you said hey we've got to do something different so again I expect changes to happen I expect things to happen in a year two years five years code of Virginia could change and might mandate to have to be some of these changes but again last thing I think is again as long as there's a focus by the the members which we already have this with the members by the administration by the fire chief staff and by you as the board that focus on service delivery to the citizens. That's, that's the number one. How we get there you know, is, is a muddy way we do. But number one is it's the service delivery, I think, is, is the thing, as long as we keep focus on. Thank you, Mr. Green. Okay. Anyone, else, anyone else wishing to for, speak, please come forward at this time. Okay. I'll close the... Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a request <clears throat> um, from Mr. Beach and Mr. Cox. Would it be possible to get a written version? I know, Mr. Beach, you read yours. Would it be possible for us to get a written version of what you said? Thanks. Mr. Cox, too. Yeah, Mr. Cox and Mr. Beach, if I wasn't clear. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Norvig. Uh, Mr. Singer, 
Chief Singh, will you come? I got a couple quick questions, <coughs> follow up questions. Yes, sir. I, I did close the public hearing. I'm, I assume I did. I'm closing the public hearing. Now I'm going to speak to you, Chief. Thanks, sir. Um, Mr. Cox brought to our attention that he had recently seen, recently seen the, the ordinance, 22 pages. When was that distributed to the senior policy group? Actually, he was quoting off not of the code changes. He was quoting off of internal policy, which is a document about creating policy within the department, which has been brought forward to the senior policy group, has been gone through both reviews, and actually is a document that what was already approved by the senior policy group, and none of these points were brought up and complained about at that time. As for these specific code changes here to the county code, these were brought forward to the to the um, to the members early in January before they were brought to you, and they've also gone through the senior policy group um, at least twice, uh, including the other night. And the only recommendation that came forth was Chief Beach uh, had a recommendation that we change it to fire and EMS instead of calling it fire and rescue because he felt there was confusion between fire and rescue department and the rescue squad. And that was the only point that was brought forth by any of the chiefs in the room at that time. So so the rescue squad has a representative on the senior policy group? Chief Beach. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions of staff at this time? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Williams. Chief, sorry to get you. That's all right, sir. Give you more exercise tonight. That's right. Um, is it anything <clears throat> in what Mr. Beach just shared with you that you would like to share with us in, in contrast? As in, I, I'd have to know which <clears throat> points you would like me to address. Obviously, the squad has done a wonderful job. They continue to do a wonderful job. They have saved the county countless man hours, countless funding over the years that they've been here. That is, that is all correct. I can't dispute that at all. And I'm not looking to replace them even though I think you're one of the few board members I haven't talked to uh, recently. Um, but I believe I was misquoted in, in what they're saying, and I, I say the same thing to Chief Beach. I said the same thing to his board. I said the same thing to several of the other board members that I've seen more recently. It is that in the, over the next year, we're, we're looking to extend our contract services right now, um, providing for the, uh, the, our daytime staffing and our advanced life support staffing over the next year. But during that year, we really need to take a hard look at the contract services that we're using because I really feel that in the long run, we can probably, as the county, hire our own career people to handle at least the driving of the ambulances and possibly also the ALS support. Right now, we're paying $25 an hour to our contract services for a person to drive an ambulance. And I'm pretty sure I can get someone working part-time a lot less than $25 to drive an ambulance around the county. So while our contract service is very convenient, we have to take a hard look over the next year at what we're doing and look to hiring our own people to do those ambulance services for us. That doesn't mean I'm looking to replace everyone on the rescue squad. I'm looking to fine tune and save money with our contract services. So, so, <clears throat> so possibly they misconstrued that, but I've said the same thing, like I said, to Mr. Beach, to his board, to his members that came to my office and talked to me and several of the board members here that that's we need to take a hard look at what we're doing with the money that we are using towards EMS because I think we can save money. I don't think any of us have a problem with that. The, the question I think on you know, my mind is when we had the ALS meeting, you know, and that discussion, mm -hmm. one of the complaints that I believe I heard was this blueprint going forward and having buy-in to the blueprint as we move forward. That's correct. You know, as a board member, <clears throat> uh, I'm not hearing buy-in tonight. <clears throat> Can you share I mean, any comments or anything like that? Because I, I would agree with you. Uh, I've been waiting to meet with the OMD and Mr. Beach. That is actually scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, she's been out of town on vacation. So we can further discuss the EMS plan. We can further discuss what the county is expecting of the rescue squad and what services they're expecting them to provide and see and guiding them and helping them get to where they can provide those services to the level that we're talking about. Because that's what I would like to see. Correct. I would like to see buying. Nobody is, I think, in opposition to the goals to provide better quality service, even service throughout the county. Sir. All of us are at the top of our list is public safety. Make no mistake. 
What we do want, though, is to get buy-in with our volunteers, like Mr. Norvick pointed out. Yes, sir. Volunteerism in Powhatan County are synonymous. Always has been. Angry. And we want to understand going forward, <clears throat> and we know, understand this is an evolving process, not unlike Chesterfield, but we want to understand, and I want buy-in from the rescue squad, as to how we move forward with this thing, a, a blueprint or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and how we can make informed decisions about how we go forward with this, I guess, centralized uh, service delivery system that you're proposing? Because it's all, well, you're, you're frowning, so go ahead. No, I, I, yeah, I'm, not, I'm confused about what you mean by centralized service delivery. I mean just under one single Unify, department. I'm, I'm Unifying all the departments. Unified, all the departments, unified yes. with you essentially over right. top of it. Correct. Okay, I misspoke. That's okay. Um, so that's what we're interested in, in right. seeing that buy-in and how we evolve, as, as David pointed out, as Floyd pointed out, <clears throat> it is an evolving process. And, and things do change. We just want to make sure that we don't kill volunteerism in this county, I that agree. we have the buy-in, the support from all entities if we're moving forward with this unified um, approach. I agree with you. And like I said, I, I haven't been able to talk to you, and I've talked to some of the other board members in the past weeks or so, um, but bringing forth <coughs> that EMS plan that you might have seen and, and coming up collaboratively with the OMD and with the rescue squad and bringing forth a document that they support mm -hmm. and the OMD supports and the county feels is what they will support mm -hmm. is where we first need to start and we need to work on that yeah. and that's <clears throat> one part of the steps we're taking tomorrow is determining what you feel is a proper response time through the county and what the rescue squads can support or together what we can reach towards in the future. And I'm anxious to see that study as well as to learn more about, you know, as Dave pointed out, you know, what Chesterfield has done and how mm -hmm. they've done it all the time. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, any other questions of staff at this time? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, can I say something first, Mr. Sure. Tucker? Um, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief Singer, for thank your you. explanations. Before I say my comments, I want to say, first of all, that I think I have a tremendous amount of respect for Allen Beach. Mrs. Beach and the entire rescue squad. Um, somebody who pretty wise with uh, EMS and fire told me that uh, one of the things, hardest thing is to be an advocate for groups, but also be a policymaker. And that's very difficult. Uh, it's a fine line to run, and it's, it's a challenge. Change is hard, but at times it's necessary. Uh, I have a fundamental problem if something was given to somebody in January and it's coming up tonight why those things weren't passed along to the chief or to staff before April the 6th. I do agree with Mr. Williams that we need to understand how it was implemented in Chesterfield, but Mr. Bailey, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, known him for many, many years and his, his service in Chesterfield, has told us that it takes time. It will evolve, just as Mr. Foy Green said, just like the Conference of Planning, Zoning, and Subdivision Ordinances. I think it's time to pass the policy and then allow the, the senior policy group to massage and work it. But I also want to encourage that there be an advocate for all groups to include the fire, to include the rescue, so that everyone has the buy-in that Mr. Williams is looking for. I, the volunteer organizations of this county are tremendous and we could not survive without them. I applaud every one of them, but I think it's time to begin the process. I am in support of moving this ordinance forward. Thank you. Mr. Tucker, I'm sorry. So, Chief, come back. <laughs> yes, sir. Cut to the chase for us and for the press sound bites. Two questions for you. Sir. What is the value add of this ordinance? The value. Three, three sentences or less. The value add. Why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Why to, we to, doing it? To, to legally, under the county code, bring all the organizations together. Um, right now, not all the organizations report to me. And yes, it, it, it does affect the rescue squad greatly because that is what doing it is bringing the rescue squad under the county and under the fire department and under the direction. Currently, they are very much autonomous, very much their own agency. So this ordinance brings all those groups together, all the fire departments, the rescue squad, emergency management, 
all your emergency services other than your sheriff's department into one organization to be, be okay so my question is still on the table what's the value add of doing that tell me what it, why it, you why you're proposing it putting them all on the one that's just a that's just a symptom right tell but me what it is you're trying to accomplish bringing bringing all the policies and procedures together between the different organizations right now the rescue squad has their own procedures the fire department has their own procedures mix that together with the dispatch it, it, it's all different procedures under different things so we need to try to bring all those procedures together so we're all operating seamlessly and we can all operate together for the best good of the department. all right so so standardization is one of the value adds what else uh, obviously budgeting where we can bring all the budgets together at one time currently the rescue squad budget is separated from the fire department budgets so bringing them all together shows us where we where we're, we where we can save money by doing some things here or some things there and bring all those budget funds together. So the second reason is you're trying to figure out economies of scale if we can use that term between the, the two major entities. Anything else that value add that, that, that you're doing this for or you're proposing or we're considering this for? Uh, in the future, obviously, as we move forward, mm -hmm. it'll also give you the ability to correct the, the staffing things that we have. We're looking at the financing um, of our current contract providers. And in the future, as we look towards our study and also continue to study fire, our fire responses, when we get to the point that we may need to add fire personnel also, the department is already in place where we can start adding possibly providers that can do both fire and EMS and can go both ways and provide those type of services. So being together instead of separate, we can, we can save the county money by getting providers that can do both those jobs if needed. So, so can I translate that into sure. a, a, an attempt on the county's part to create an integrated strategy? Sure. Is that a fair way to say it? Yes, sir. I don't mean to put words in your mouth. No, sir. <laughs> are there other reasons that we are proposed, that we're considering this proposal? You've given me three. Ms. Weiler? I believe that um, Floyd said it best, and that is so that all of our citizens receive the same services and always it's the health and safety and welfare of our citizens and how best do we deliver our services to provide health, safety, welfare for our citizens. Not that we're not doing it today, we are doing it today and we're all all of our volunteers are doing a great job and our volunteers will continue to do a great job this is in no way as chief singer has said replacing the volunteers we cannot do this without the volunteers but um, as floyd had said and um, when you first brought the five fire departments together that was change for the for the fire departments it's change when you bring people together but in the end i think it has resulted um, in better services to all of our citizens for, our, for them um, to bring them all under one roof. All right, so I'm not being argumentative. I'm right. really not. Okay. I need to understand how centralization on the central authority is going to create more equity among the recipients of the services. That's, that's a nice thing to say, and we all agree. Um, but how does that translate into action on the ground? How does, how does what you're proposing actually going to give more equitable response times to everybody in the county regardless of where they live? Like I said, uh, bringing bring the, the organizations together will allow us to, uh, it, if we, when we bring over the uh, medical EMS license under the county department, then not just the rescue squad will have authority to bill, then they will come underneath the county which means we can also use other providers like people at the fire stations that don't necessarily run EMS calls now. When, since they're under our license, they could also be used to help. I mean, they respond now as first responders, but we could also look moving towards them staffing ambulances and assisting with ambulances and things like that. Again, I'm talking way far ahead. I haven't even talked to the rescue squad about this. The, they're probably cringing in their seats yeah. over there talking about merging it that far together where people would be running, running the equipment that way. But that, that's a, a way that we can utilize the manpower that we have and expand on that manpower to provide services throughout the county. All right, let me summarize my first question my, go ahead. before I go to the second question. Okay. So the reasons for this proposal, other than we put it in our strategic plan, which doesn't mean anything, we had to have a reason to do it. 
standardization, economies of scale, an integration of a strategy between all the people who are first responders, and lastly, to try to move in the direction that really attaches to the third one of all clients being served equally to the best of our ability. Are they the three reasons that we're proposing to do this? Yes, sir. May I go to the second question? <laughs> you got the mic, Mr. Tucker. My second question is, in a nutshell, would you tell me your take on Mr. Beach's objection? Uh, give it to me in three sentences flat out. Just say what you need to say. Not attack Mr. Beach. Change is hard. Excuse me. Excuse me. I asked Mr. Beach not to attack you. Well, yes, I'm sir. Asking uh, for uh, and I would, uh, I would ask that. Not at all. You should have Ch Ch Change is very hard. The, red, the rescue squad members are very dedicated. I enjoyed their dedication. I know we'll be using that dedication going forward. But we need to bring them underneath the fire department to, to join all the emergency services together so we're all operating together. Right now they are very autonomous and do a lot of the things they want to do and we need to bring them together and all emergency services together into one coordinated unit. Did I answer it, Mr. Tucker? No. Okay. I ask it. The, the, the idea of change, I think we all understand. In, any change, and there are a thousand people in, this, in the past keeping you from moving forward. I understand that we're all resistant to change because right. we've got a good thing going. And as Mr. B shared with us since 1956, it's delivered the goods. So are you, I'm asking you to get in Mr. Beach's head, which I'm already in because I've been talking to me. Is there anything else that you think is going on that we need to know? We need to call this out because obviously we got some friction here in the room to Mr. Williams's point. And we don't have agreement on a path forward here. Help me understand what the resistance is about from your perspective. Uh, I think personally, when uh, when I got here uh, four months ago, uh, things have moved a little fast. Um, first off, with the rescue squad, and I can understand that. But I do still feel that the needs for an ALS provider was a critical need that was the, for the needs of our citizens. I understand that that <clears throat> process moved very quickly, and it was met with resistance by the rescue squad, and that's why they tend to resist a lot of things that are coming forward, because they did not get a lot of say in um, towards the ALS provider. Um, that was something that I brought forward to the board members and that obviously between us and, and myself, obviously I, I recognize that as a critical need that we weren't providing the advanced services that we should be providing to our citizens. So that, I will agree, was handled improperly and went too fast for the services that, you know, and the system that we're looking to do here. Now, moving forward, obviously, as I've talked about uh, and said to Mr. Norvig, more things are, are slowed down and, and moving at the policy group play pace that these things need to move at, where things are developed and things are talked about a lot more in depth before they move forward. So your answer to my second question is a, is a two-pronged one. One, the normal resistance we all have to anything that's going to change what we're used to, comfortable with, and which is deliver the goods. Mm -hmm. And the second is maybe we went too fast, particularly around the ALS. Are you suggesting that that soured the overall yes, movement? Sir. In it? You are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Mr. Norvig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chief Singer, I'm, I'm just going to get right down to the bottom. Um, can you please answer uh, yes or no, and then at the end you can amplify if you wish. I, I don't want to muzzle you at all. Um, with the adoption of this ordinance, will we have better response times? No, okay. not initially. Okay. Will we have better trained personnel? Not initially. Will we have better equipment? Not, and not initially. I mean, these are all things, obviously, that as we move forward and we've started to budget for further training, $20,000 this year over no funds last year to train our personnel. Okay. And, and the apparatus that we brought forward, in fact, that you approved tonight uh, under consent for the tanker, those are the sort of things, obviously, as we move forward, we're, we're going to develop those things and, and bring them for you. So not initially, but can you give me an approximate time frame? Like, down the road will we have these things because of this ordinance? Yes, sir, I believe so. Bringing everything under one organization and bringing the coordination between the people will give us <clears throat> better standards, as you see, saw with, that came forth with the tanker. That was a conglomeration between the county staff, the Huguenot volunteers, and the volunteers at Fine Creek, and, and that, that came forth to you. 
Uh, our training committee that was reformed, we had no training committee when I first got here. The training committee has been reformed and they are already starting to work on standards for every rank through the department from regular firefighter all the way up through fire officer and what type of training and stuff you need to have those. But those are things that we are developing because unfortunately we are lacking a lot of those things, training standards. A lot of our SOPs are very outdated and need to be redone. And we need to bring in, bring in the rescue squad SOPs and make sure we're not doing things against what the rescue squad has already has in their practice or doesn't have in their practice okay. so we can all work together. So um, we will have better response time, better trained personnel, better equipment, but not immediately, but on the horizon. Sure. That's what you're saying, okay? And here's the most important question in my mind. And, um, you know, a short answer is fine, um, but a complete answer, whatever, whatever you'd like to say. This, in a nutshell, is what I'm looking at with this ordinance. Now, here's my question. <coughs> Will a life be saved that otherwise wouldn't have been, or a potential injury made less or prevented by adopting this ordinance? I would say yes. Thank you. May I follow up? Mr. Tucker? Thank you, sir. The questions that Mr. Norvig just asked, I think, are the right ones, and I think your answers are the appropriate answers. We hired you to be a strategist. We hired you to be an oversight, trying to figure out what the umbrella would look like. And you're doing, I think, what we ask you to do <clears throat> and we may have made some stumbles along the way as too fast or not involving people or what have you but my perception is that you're doing exactly what it is we ask you to do whether we like it or not the change is going some change is going to occur it, it has already you've heard from mr. Bailey about Chesterfield's evolution uh, I would very much on page five of your PowerPoint presentation which basically at the top has responsibilities for the fire rescue chief. Mm -hmm. that, that, that actually starts on page four, Mr. Tucker. It's a continuation. Right. I would very much like to see a capture of this strategic planning piece better than it reads here. It says planning, mm -hmm. but it goes on to say preparation and response for disaster. And that's absolutely appropriate. We need to have it on and ready to go. Floyd has done a lot of work in, in that arena. Yeah, especially but I really would opinions. like to have some more emphasis on what it is I think you're bringing to the table, which is a strategic overview of tying all the pieces together comprehensively and in a more integrated fashion. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm done. Mr. Tucker, I think that's what this ordinance begins the process to be is the ability to sit down with that senior policy group to include hopefully the senior policy leaders that would then go back to the the uh, other members of their organizations and pick up some of the years and years of experience that we have in this county to to come back and mold into these plans that you're you're describing here but i think again this is this ordinance begins that process i know that probably it's more for the rescue squad to digest than maybe the fire department to digest. But I know that in the end, the goal is to take care of the citizens and meet their services as quickly and most efficiently in the best professional way we can. And again, I, I applaud every one of the volunteers. I just think that it's time to begin and support the chief, allow the ordinance to become implemented and allow it to morph and I do want to use the word advocate because someone shared that with me to make sure that every group has an advocate that, that, that uh, as you implement policies and uh, that you're an advocate back to, to the county administrator, to them, and to us. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Williams. Since you're on two words or three words or less, <coughs> I'll go ahead and give my, my take on it. Are citizens at risk in the county today? No, I believe uh, once we added the ALS provider, which was a, a critical issue we have. Uh, but that was a modified form of what you originally recommended, right? Because we didn't, we didn't go, we started scheduling that ASL provider after we asked the question, how many do you need? And you took your time, you came back to us, and you said right. the equivalent of six. Right. 
And, and, and like then I we said, started and, scheduling them by when we had open spots on the calendar, didn't we? That's correct. So the volunteers are supplying uh, ALS personnel. They get the first choice. And if they're unable to supply it, then we bring <coughs> the contract person to allow us to have at least one ALS provider on duty all the time. All right. So let me follow up with my second three words or last question. Um, so citizens are not at risk today. What's broke today? Today, mm -hmm. uh, our response times are very slow. Uh, not to everywhere and not all the time, but we do need to look at the EMS plan, as I was saying, and sit down with the rescue squad and with the board members and the OMD. As the state ordinance says, the EMS plan is supposed to be a conglomerate of those three uh, agencies or, or authorities to discuss what type of response times do you feel is necessary for your citizens? 25 minutes? 35 minutes? or would you like to see that down in the 15 to 20 minute range? So that, that discussion could happen today, couldn't it? It could, but we need the OMD and she's been on vacation. Like I said, we right. have a first right. meeting for that I mean, it, tomorrow. There's no reason that it's not happening other than that, right? Correct. Okay. Um, I'm just speaking for myself. I know from <clears throat> my experience when you're working with different organizations, it's important to have buy-in. Now, at some point, you have to make a decision, and I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. You want a unified service delivery system to, you know, all the reasons that, you know, you put forward with budgeting, response times, and all like that. But the thing that bothers me, <clears throat> if, if you're going to have a marriage, let's make sure the marriage is getting off on the right foot. Yes, sir. You know, start like you're going to finish. You know, if I said to you, <clears throat> If you went back to the rescue squad and you had 30 days to work with them to get what I thought we were going to get when we had the ALS meeting, and that was the blueprint. Now, one of the things that you just said, you were saying some things tonight that they probably were you know, cringing at because they hadn't heard before. Why can't we go ahead and put that out there so that everybody understands what the plan is so that we can get the buy-in? and the commitment that we need. Does that sound plausible? I agree with you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And again, I, I don't disagree with you, uh, that, but I think that, that takes place over a period of time. This, at this time, I have one last question for you, Chief. Sure. Do you, do you have the authority to have the Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad adopt an EMS plan at this time? No, sir. Without this ordinance, you have no authority to ask that. Okay. No, sir. And, and actually, well, no, do not. Okay. It's, it would be between you and the OMD and uh, the Rescue okay. Squad. And again, this is not an attack on Powhatan Volunteer Rescue Squad. Not at all. It's just a question because, again, I have a tremendous amount of respect for everybody that's over there. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions of staff at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chief, for coming back to the, the mic um, repeatedly. repeatedly. Um, I, I'm going to make a motion. I, I move that we approve Ordinance 2015-04, amending the Chapter 46, <coughs> to begin the process. Second. Any comments or questions? I have a comment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am generally in favor of this ordinance, but Doubts were raised, and I'm not quite sure I'm ready to pull the trigger on this, although I understand, you know, paralysis by analysis is a problem. Uh, my background as a naval aviator, I had to make snap decisions, and my life depended on it many times. So I'm not adverse to making quick decisions based on the best knowledge I have. One problem I have right now is we have an empty seat over there. We've got Mr. Hodge not with us, and some additional information has come up, that's kind of put this discussion in a new light. Um, so between the things that were brought up tonight and the fact that Mr. Hodge is not here, and I think he should have the privilege of hearing some of this information personally, um, I would like to defer one more time call this decision. We call for a vote and first on me. <clears throat> can I ask Tom? Mr. Tom, Tom if, that, that's, well, that's a, that's a superseding motion if he gets a second. If he gets a second, that motion supersedes the yes vote on this motion first. Uh, and <clears throat> just to speak to it real, real quickly, um, I've learned some things tonight. 
I always do when we have a public meeting. That's the great thing about having a robust dialogue with staff, <clears throat> the public, our volunteers, among ourselves. Um, I don't think any of us are against a, a unified service delivery for this county. What we want to do is we want to make sure that we do it in such a way that all of us are on board in terms of how we're moving forward with this blueprint to move us in the direction to be at that point in time where we need to be when those changes that are going to occur in the county over time. We know what's going to happen. Change is inevitable. We know that. So I'm, the reason I second Mr. Norvick's motion is because I would like to see during the next 30 days until our next regular meeting, the information from Chesterfield, how they did it, you know, get a comfort level. I think it would be helpful for the volunteers at the rescue squad to have that information to get buy-in about, well, we're not doing something here in Powhatan County that hasn't been done in other localities, that we really are proceeding in a prudent, studied manner, making sure that we're not getting too far in front of ourselves in terms of where we are today. That's the only reason that I'm voting for the you know, deferral at this time, to mm -hmm. give that give folks the opportunity to give you, Chief, the opportunity to go back yet again with, you know, an opportunity to get that buy-in that we talked about last time, you know, you were before us with the ALS situation. And, and that's fine, but with the dedication we have at the Rescue Squad, I really feel you're not going to get a change from the Rescue Squad. They would like to remain their own agency for the foreseeable future. Well, I'm not going and to I, I can't to speak for them right now, but that since I became here day one, that is what they have told me, is they want to remain their own agency and not come under the county. Well, again, that's the reason I'm asking for the uh, history of Chesterfield, how they went about it, because as a supervisor, uh, if I have that information, mm -hmm. You're much can, better if I have good information, I, I can make a better decision. Would you like any other jurisdictions, uh, other comparables, such as Goochland or Caroline County, yes, New yeah. Kent, and the rest yes, of the county? Yes, I'm, I'm going okay. to I'm 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 defer to you because you know, you're, you're my expert. That's fine. I, and it seems we, we use Chesterfield a lot in our correlations, and obviously there are much larger jurisdictions. And I'm not sure if I'll be able to contact the people who were even there two decades ago when that kind Chief, of transition Chief, happened. the only reason I say Chesterfield is because I know Mr. Melton and I are familiar with Manchester Rescue Squad, Forest View. We, we know people that serve there. I know two presidents of Manchester and, and Forest View. So and growing up I'm, and being... You're you know, familiar with those organizations. I, I'm familiar. That was the reason I brought those guys up. Not a problem. That's, that's all. I will, I will get you some comparables of how, uh, how it's happened in other jurisdictions. So, Mr. Norvick, just so I hear the motion correctly, you're motiv making a motion to defer to a next regular schedule, scheduled meeting. I am, sir. Your second of that, Mr. Williams. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'll call for a vote on the motion to defer till the next regular scheduled meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. <laughs> motion passes 3 1. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks for all who spoke tonight. We'll move on to uh, item 10B. Ordinance 2015-5, granting conditional use permit to Sharon and Earl Williams. JDS kids, I think Mr. Altman will handle this. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, this evening we have a public hearing for you to consider a request submitted by Ms. Ms. Sharon and Mr. Earl Williams to operate a child daycare center at 2116 Lakeview Drive. This conditional use permit uh, is a request for renewal of an existing permit that was granted by the Board of Supervisors in May of 2013. The property is currently zoned RU, residential utility, and in that district, child daycare, child daycare centers are listed as a conditional use, uh, thus the requirement for the public hearing for the renewal. The Planning Commission discussed this item at their March 3rd meeting. They conducted a public hearing. No citizens spoke during the public hearing. The commission voted 4-0 uh, voted to recommend approval with one member being absent. During the staff's review of the request, there were no comments, uh, negative comments from the existing review agencies, and there have been no uh, reports of any violations of the conditions of the current C the CUP that's currently in place uh, that was granted by the board in 13. Staff is recommending approval uh, to 
of the request for the conditional use permit with several conditions. Uh, those conditions include the following. The applicant shall consent to an annual administrative inspections by the planning department staff for compliance with the requirements of the CUP. The applicant shall sign the list of adopted conditions for the CUP signifying acceptance and intent to comply with these conditions. Three, failure to comply with the conditions of the CUP may result in the issuance of a notice of violation by the zoning administrator. The zoning administrator may present the CUP to the Board of Supervisors for revocation if the, the NOD is not resolved as directed. Upon issuance of a third notice of violation of the permit and failure for the permit holder to appeal to the Board of Zoning Appeals, the zoning administrator shall present the CUP to the Board of Supervisors for revocation. Four, the conditional use permit for a child daycare center is issued for a maximum of 12 children as licensed by the Virginia Department of Social Services. Any physical expansion of the facility, whether beyond the current building or for more than 12 children, require a new or amended conditional use permit. Five, the child daycare center shall be properly certified and licensed by the Virginia Department of Social Services, and any suspension or revocation of said license by the agency will make this conditional use permit null and void. Six, the child daycare center will, re will open no earlier than 6 a.m. and close no later than 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. The child daycare center will not operate on Saturday or Sunday. Outdoor play areas shall be limited to a fenced rear yard. Existing fencing and gates shall be maintained. Seven, the address numbers shall be a minimum of four inches in height and reflective so they are highly visible from both directions from Lakeview Drive. The address number shall be maintained throughout the life of the CEP. Six, eight, excuse me, eight, all activities associated with the CEP shall be com in compliance with all state and federal laws. The site shall fully comply with all applicable provisions of section 83-352 of the Powhatan County Zoning Ordinance throughout the life of the CEP. And the last condition, the CEP conditional use permit shall be issued to Sharon and Earl Williams to operate a child daycare center on the lot. Um, the existing daycare center, all of the children's activities are in the backyard. They are in a fenced area, so that is they are compliant with that condition. And as I said before, uh, we've had no complaints from any of the surrounding neighbors and no reports of any violation of any of the current conditions. I'd be happy to answer any questions of the board if you have them. Any questions of staff? Mr. Chairman. The same four questions we always ask. I think you've answered them all. No okay. notice was a violation. Correct. No complaints. Correct. As far as you're concerned, or no, no traffic issues. Yes, sir. And no social service department concerns. No, they, we do have a copy of um, a Department of Social Services inspection uh, with several inspection dates in your packet. However, uh, upon further inspection of the inspection dates and the results <coughs> of the violation, the violations were very minor. Uh, very minor, nothing that would draw any concern of ours regarding the care of or care and safety of any children in that facility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions of staff? Would the applicant like to say anything? It's not necessary, but we do usually allow you to speak if you'd like. Okay, you don't have to. Okay, at this time I'll have a public hearing on uh, conditional use permit for Sharon and Earl Williams. Anyone wishing to come forward, please do so at this time. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Mr. Williams, this is in your district. <laughs> <laughs> you want to make a and motion? There's no relationship here. Yeah, we'll so, say I that. mean, yeah, that was kind of a oh, handoff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick question, Mr. Chairman. Can we lengthen the time to come back for this conditional use permit? I'm seeing cars not up down. Uh, Larry? Yeah, this is what the second time has come back for renewal. Or? This is the first. It was on a two-year renewal in the 13 when you issued it originally. So this is the first renewal. Uh, as we've said before, there 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 are no there is no requirement for a specific time frame. It's the, the ordinance says the board may place a time frame. So you can link it to whatever you like or give it to them for indefinitely. Well, I, I'd like to. You know, this is something we've talked about. I know at the planning commission and at the board level. To get out of this business of the CUP renewals, having people come back every two years, because y'all guys can handle it. With the notice of violations, if you got a problem, y'all can handle it. We, we don't need to be asking people to come back every two years. So I, I'm going to make the motion that we don't put a renewal on it, that we go ahead and approve it tonight, Mr. Chairman. That's fine with me. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Tucker. 
Mr. Alden, do you have any problems with that at all? No, sir. Yeah. I think Mr. Lee was absolutely correct. <clears throat> we have the ability through the violations to deal with it. They're not complying. We bring it back to the board for consideration of yeah. So, so you could. So, if we do it for an indefinite period of time, and there's problems, notice of violations, or things that come up, then you could then propose to revoke the conditional use permit, bring it back for the board for that. Yes, we can. We will. We still have the ability to do the requirement in the conditions to do annual inspections. If during our inspections we find that they're not complying and we issue a notice of violation, they aren't corrected within 30 days, and we work with them, we we, we will bring it back. To look for revoking the permit. Okay, and as long as annual inspections, because some of these intensify. Yeah, I mean conditional use permits for working on, you know, uh, lawnmowers turns into working on cars, mm -hmm. it turns into working mm -hmm. on some other things. So as they intensify, sometimes they they seem to balloon out. So yes. uh, as long as there's inspections and and uh, and an opportunity for us is that if a conditional use permit, because it is a conditional use permit, mm -hmm. and conditions are placed there, so it protects the. This, the safety and welfare of the adjoining landowners. So That's right. I'm okay with the Mr. Williams, have you made a motion? Yes, he has. Yes, I did. I'll second sure. it. Any comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We now move on to 11A action items resolution R2015 amending the Board of Supervisors bylaws to add a closed session protocol. Page 130. I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Latchney. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is an item that was uh, initiated by the board uh, last month or a little over a month ago asking for some protocol on, by, by, on in our bylaws or your board bylaws so that if there's going to be a closed meeting that you receive the information at the same time as the agenda schedule. So when you receive your agenda information, you'll also receive any items that are related to the closed session. Uh, I, I, we actually put in front of you, there was a, a typo in the, the one that's in the file, so we have a corrected version in front of everybody of the motion. And, and one other thing, Mr. Chairman, while we're looking, I was reading this whole thing, the whole bylaws, and, and there's a typo if you want to correct it at the same time. In Article 18, postponements, right now it says, all hearings and other matters previously advertised should be conducted at a meeting and no further advertisement is required. I think we meant to say at the next scheduled meeting. So if you all want as a housekeeping matter, maybe correct this under postponements as well. Right now it just says shall be conducted at a meeting, but it doesn't say what meeting. I'm not, we intended it to be the next regularly scheduled or next scheduled meeting. So. Can we do both of these at once or you want two separate? I, you can do it at the same time. Just If you just <coughs> the motion that we provided to you and then say with the amendment of correcting Section 18 as requested by the county attorney. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve resolution R2015-25 as amended by the county attorney with the request, yeah. and with the uh, and with the uh, and correction, the typo at the next meeting, right for section eight. And then section eighteen of those comments, yes. Second again. All in favor? Question. Aye. Aye. All, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes four zero. I apologize. Uh, resolution R 2015-29 fixing the calendar year. 2015 per personal property tax rate. Ms. Weiler, are you going to take that? Um, yes, sir. The um, adoption of the personal property tax rates are coming forward to you this evening rather than when you adopt your budget because the treasurer is preparing to print the bills for the invoices that are due in June. All of the rates stay the same as last year's rates, as the calendar year 2014 rates, with the exception of the reduction <coughs> of um, the disabled veterans in the volunteer fire and rescue personnel property tax rates. Because they stayed the same or went down, we were not required to advertise the adoption of the personal property tax rate. So I stand ready to answer any questions you may have on the resolution. Any questions of staff? Can I get a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve 2000 R 2015-25 exactly as presented by the county administrator. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Resolution 2015 requesting that an economic development authority of the county of Powhatan, Virginia, issue its lease revenue refunding bond to refund outstanding lease revenue bonds. Okay. Um, with us here this evening to do an updated presentation for you is Kyle Locks with Davenport. In your agenda packet on page number, yes, but on, starting on page 158 is the presentation that Mr. Locks did on March 9th. He does have an update. Do you have a distribution for the board I on do. that presentation? We would like to let you know that when it comes time for you to adopt the resolution, we have a number for you to insert on page 
two or page 149. So we'll go over that motion that we need for you to do to insert the dollar amount into it. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Watts. All right. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, nice to see you all this evening. Um, Thank you. I'll talk a little slow while, while March hands these out. But what you have in front of you is largely an update of what you saw last month. And if you recall last month, we talked about an opportunity to refinance existing county debt um, for savings purposes, just to go from a higher rate to a lower rate um, without extending any final maturity, just keeping the same final maturity. And so what we have before you tonight is an update on that. And tonight would basically be the evening you would take action to formally authorize that and continue this process moving forward. So got a couple pages to kind of talk about where we are and what the next steps are. Um, an update on where the numbers are in terms of the savings, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I'll turn it over to, uh, to my, my colleague um, from McGuire Woods, who's your bond counsel, um, and he can talk about the actual sort of legal uh, resolution that you have before you. Um, so with that, I'll start in the background and I'll move relatively quickly, but um, earlier in March, uh, we had talked about this opportunity uh, you would kind of given us our blessing or your blessing to move forward with the process. We've done that. Um, that's involved um, getting the EDA together. They're going to be the legal conduit for the financing. It's really your, meaning the county board of supervisors, um, sort of obligations, but they happen to be the, the legal conduit under Virginia law. So we've talked to them. They know kind of what the process is. Um, we've coordinated and organized conference calls with the two rating agencies that rate the county's debt. That's Moody's and that's Standard & Poor's. Those are scheduled for tomorrow, so that's moving along um, as we had hoped. Um, and we've been working closely with your staff and with McGuire Woods to get the various legal documents all pulled together so we can be here this evening. Um, again, there will be a resolution we'd ask that you adopt tonight if you're comfortable and answer all your questions. Um, and at that point, that would put us in a position to go sell refunding bonds and basically lock in interest rates um, towards the end of the month. We've got a little more specific schedule. I'll fill you on in the next couple pages. Page number two, uh, just a little summary and a little reminder again of what we're talking about in terms of the individual obligations. Um, there's two particular, I'll call them loans, the term loan bonds, it all kind of gets thrown around, but basically two particular loans we're looking at. Um, the first of the 2007 lease revenue bonds. Um, we're going to be refinancing about $18.8 .8 million. That's the entire remaining balance of that loan. Um, currently has an average interest rate of a 490 and a current final maturity in fiscal year 2032. And again, we're not extending that final maturity. We're keeping the same final maturity and just bringing the interest rate lower. Uh, the second obligation is a 2010 lease revenue bond. That was for the Huguenot Public Safety Station. Uh, a little bit over $5 million. Again, we're refinancing the entire outstanding balance of that loan. Um, the average interest rate on that loan right now is a 351. Has a final maturity in fiscal 2031. Again, same concept, not extending um, the final maturity. And so in total, we're refinancing about $24 million, rounding off um, in, in principal amount. Um, one additional caveat on the 2010 loan. It has a, a, um, a rate reset feature that happens out in 2025. It was originally a 20-year loan with a 15-year fixed rate. And so we're really going to be doing two things as we refinance that loan. First is hopefully bring the rate down. The second is to go ahead and lock that rate in for the whole remaining uh, term of the loan. So I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Go right ahead. You want us to interrupt you or wait till the end? However you want, I'd be happy to answer your questions. So, so I just, if I just heard you, the footnote at the bottom of the page, two, the August of 1st, 2025, will be subject of negotiation as you go forward with the rate to change it to 2031? Is that what you just said? Well, what I just said is your existing loan, if we did nothing today, we're into the future, your existing loan, when you get to August of 2025, that 351 rate is going to change to something else. We don't know what that is. We're based on the market. Even, with the even if we choose to go forward. No, no, no. If we choose to go forward, we choose to go forward. Reset. You're going to be set and locked in all the way through final maturity. Question. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Sorry if that was yep. a long way to answer the question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you got it. Thank you. Um, so on page number three, uh, this is this is our refinancing update, um, and sort of cutting straight to the chase. This is what we think if we were able to sell bonds today. Um, this is what we think the savings, the interest rates would look like based on the current market. Um, 
in total. Uh, it's about $2.3 million in savings over the life of the loan. Um, that equates to 7.6% of the refunded par on a net present value basis. That's an important number because what's in your resolution is that the refinancing will achieve at least 3% on a net present value basis um, if in order for the refinancing to move forward. So it's an important number. It's kind of a, a safety mechanism in there um, because we nor anybody else knows what interest rates are going to go in the future. And so what this resolution is basically going to say is if we can make sure we can achieve at least that 3% savings, which equates to about $1.1 million in, in more simple terms, then the refinancing transaction goes forward. If for some reason rates go jumping up in the next couple of weeks and we can't meet that minimum savings level, then the transaction doesn't happen, kind of goes back on the shelf um, until such time as, as hopefully rates are, again, favorable enough to do that refinancing. So that's an important concept that within your resolution there's a minimum savings threshold um, that's built into the resolution whereby, and that's net savings too, so that's after all costs. Okay. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, the next check, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think you were going to ask the same question. Yeah, you, you asked. Uh, <clears throat> so, the total of 2.3 uh, in savings is net of any cost. That's right. Okay. That's right. Now, if any, anytime we're talking about a refinancing with you, we're already sort of just, making just, sure it's a net. Just number. for my information, what yep. was the cost? Cost is going to be in between one and two percent of the size of the loan. It's probably going to be in the one and a half percent range. Um, which in round dollars equates to about uh, 300 plus thousand dollars by the time you factor in the underwriting component of it. So we're investing 300,000 to get 2.3? Is that, is that yes, simplistic? Sir. But I think that's what you're saying. Yes, sir. All right. Um, uh, in, in, in round numbers, in terms of interest rate wise, we're paying right now about a 461 on these two loans on average. Uh, the current market is about at 280 right now. So that's a pretty good reduction in terms of overall interest. Um, translates directly into today's market roughly about $140,000 a year. And you can see that in the table over in column D. Uh, page number four. Other sort of general considerations for you. Um, We've talked about this the last time, just a reminder that kind of the way we're going about this and the structure, it's the same structure you have in place right now. Um, it's utilizing lease revenue bonds issued through the ADA, which is a very widely used um, financing structure in Virginia. Um, the ADA, again, it's just a, it's a legal conduit under the, the, um, you know, the Public Finance Act within Virginia, basically within the laws of, of Virginia, that's kind of the, the way the structure works. And so we'll be at the EDA on Wednesday night asking for their approval of a resolution that would allow this all to, to go forward. Um, the, the bonds will be sold via what we call a competitive sale. Um, and what that basically means is on a given day and given time, the bonds will be offered on a, on a bidding system that's used widely across the country. Um, it's, it's relatively simple in that the lowest interest cost wins. Um, and we'll talk about when that, when that date is. It's a little flexible. We've kind of have a date penciled in, presuming the markets sort of hang in there for us um, and everything works out as, as we'd hope. We are trying to move this as fast as you know, we sort of reasonably can. Um, we you know rates are good right now. And again, with some of the influences of between the Federal Reserve and, and the sort of geopolitical environment, nobody really knows where rates are going to go. So the sense is, hopefully the sooner we can lock this in, the less risk we have in the future in terms of rates going up and down. Um, again, all financing parties, and we talked about this last month, but uh, basically work at risk with one exception that includes us, um, the lawyers, the rating agencies, the one we talked about last month, um, whereby if we get them to give us a rating and for some reason a transaction doesn't happen, um, they do basically make us pay for that rating. They're pretty good about working with you. Um, if in fact the, the transaction didn't happen because rates didn't work, um, but I just want to make sure we point that out in, in sort of full disclosure. So on page number five, our timetable, our next steps, um, if everything kind of works as we'd hope, which it is thus far, um, tonight we're talking with you and with your approval of resolution, we can keep moving forward. 
Um, tomorrow, we're talking with both Moody's and Standard & Poor's via phone. Wednesday, the EDA would take their action to legally authorize the financing as the conduit. Um, and then basically, mid next week, we'd have our ratings back, we'd have our legal documents ready to send out to the marketplace. Um, and Wednesday, April 22nd, uh, which is basically two weeks, roughly speaking, rounded up a little bit, uh, is when the bonds would actually get sold. And that's the critical date when the interest rates are locked in. So from your, your mindset in terms of when do we know what the results are going to be, the sense is Wednesday, April 22nd, unless something shifts a little bit, um, that's the day we'll know what the interest rate is, what the savings are, and the sort of financial side of things gets locked down. Um, from there, early May, basically we close on the bonds. That's largely a process of just making sure we've got the right numbers and the right documents, making sure folks are around to sign the right documents. Really, the, the 22nd of April right now is the important day in terms of when the rates get locked in. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Any questions at this time? So, Ms. Weiler, what are the numbers of plug-in, just so we have a complete document in front of us? Okay. On page 149 of the agenda. Right. Um, on section one, right under the now therefore be it, the, where the blank is, yep. it's twenty six million seven hundred thousand. Even. Even. And that's a maximum aggregate principle of so it's not that's a not to exceed twenty six million seven hundred thousand. There's no other numbers to insert. Where's the three percent? It's on the second GW page. The second page at the bottom of the page, I think, in the board of supervisors resolution. I'm sorry, give me a page number and I'll pack it back. Um, what, um, Mr. Bruno, what what um, page number is it on the resolution or what section number? It's 4D. So I guess you said it was oh, 4D. 149, so I guess it's 150. 150, here, thank you, Mr. Bruno. Yes. So uh, under sale of bonds, 4D, it is item number um, <coughs> 3. So it's 4D um, 3. Three little eyes. The refunding achieves an aggregate net present value debt savings of not less than three percent of the refunded principal amount. I'm sorry, Pat. I don't. I'm not following. Okay. What? Um, we're on page 150. 150. Number four. Right. Sale of bonds. I got Section it. D. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank right. you. So it wasn't a blank. I thought you said there were two. No, blanks. there's only there's, there's no only blank. One blank. The only blank is on page 149. The dollar amount. The maximum. Thank you. Aggregate principal. And Mr. T.W. Bruno from McGuire Woods is here to answer any questions you might have on the resolution or any of the other um, legal questions you might have. Can you, ready for a motion? Can you just state your name? To say, to sure. T.W. Bruno from McGuire Woods. And uh, good Thank evening. And like um, the county administrator said, happy to answer any questions or w walk you through the, the nuts and bolts of this if you have any. I think we've done we've done one of these before, so we're pretty pretty. Uh, Larry hasn't done one. If you've got a question to ask it, Larry. I just have one basic question, and thanks for sitting there all that time. <laughs> I may as well ask you one to make it worthwhile <laughs> showing up, right? Um, could you please tell me what the worst possible case downside is to any of this? This whole deal. <laughs> the worst case that I could. I, I ask big questions sure. here in case you didn't know. Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make Kyle answer it. <laughs> would be three percent, one point one, right? But but basically, the worst case I could see is if you came to market and you didn't hit one of the parameters in here. More more than likely than not, the three percent parameter on the savings threshold, and so then we didn't do this deal, and so you just continue on with the existing loans, and as uh, Kyle said, you pay the rating agencies their fees. And Are we open to any kind of litigation of any kind for the financing of the things that these bonds stand for? You could. Um, the way we're going to structure it is that we wouldn't close on the bonds until uh, that would be resolved. Um, the, the way it works, there's a validation proceeding that you can go through where you file a bond ordinance with the court and you wait in a specific amount of time in accordance with the Virginia code and then once that time period has run the litigation is time barred so uh, anybody has a chance to challenge it if they want to challenge it 
uh, any of the proceedings. That happens with any bond issue that anybody goes through here. Um, so, yeah, technically there is a risk, but um, it's a common mechanism that we use, and the code provides a way to give everybody certainty that if it hasn't been challenged within a certain period of time, then there's nothing to, uh, to go back and challenge. I think I might also point out that Please come to the mic. refinancing of, of existing projects. So it's not like you're doing some new project. It's, mm. okay. right, it's an elementary school. It's a Huguenot public safety station that are already in existence. So that, that, that's probably the legal answer. And maybe, you know, Got if it. somebody's going to challenge that, they probably would challenge it in 27 or 2007, 2010. Perfect. Would be the, my, my non legal answer. <laughs> I can sleep tonight. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you're ready? Mr. Mr. Tucker, I'm ready. I move that we approve R 2015-30 with the insertion in paragraph I-1 of the figure 26,700,000. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 4-0. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for staying. Make sure you get us to 20. Two point three. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this time we'll have a discussion item, uh, an update on a strategic action plan monthly update. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item is found on the dais in front of you. You've asked me to come back monthly and update you on the action items in the strategic action plan. The last update and the first update that I gave you was on March second of two thousand fifteen. So to help you through the document, maybe make it easier, I've highlighted any changes that I've made from the March 2nd update. So the highlighted cells that are highlighted in yellow are those that have changed since I last talked with you. So the first one under priority LD1, complete the zoning and subdivision ordinance updates number seven. We are scheduled to have a public hearing and BOS adoption on the subdivision ordinance on May 5th. On the next page, page 3 of 12, public um, um, HS1, structure the new fire EMS emergency management department, item number 6, revise the power 10 code for the BOS approved changes as recommended by the fire and rescue chief. That was brought forward to you on April 6, 2015. The next item that changed is on page 5, and it is for priority HS3, evaluate the needs of our population and determine how best to respond so that they grow, develop, and age healthfully. And it's item under the first bullet under item number 2. It's at the top of page 5 of 12. Attend the Resource Council meeting for a discussion of the possibilities of how human services needs, including the needs of the ages, might be addressed. And Ms. Pemberton has already attended that meeting. On page 6 of 12, it's item ED1, priority ED1. Consider how future joint meetings with the school board may be useful in achieving greater, greater collaboration. Number three, which is schedule and hold quarterly meetings on March we had one scheduled for March 15, but you've already held that meeting, so that's complete. On page 7 of 12, priority FA3, review and update the county's financial policies, including school funding and capital projects. Item number 2, request back best practices from local jurisdictions is complete. Um, Charlotte Schubert has completed that. On page 8 of 12, Priority FA4, create an annualized prioritized capital improvement plan and other capital maintenance program with consistent viable funding sources. Item 8 was presented to the Board of Supervisors and that is complete. And item 9, recommend that the BOS adopt the FY16 CIP, that's complete. And there are no other changes from the March 2nd update. I stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. So, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Tucker. So on many of those where it says complete, it means the work that we directed you to do is complete. We're not necessarily complete. Right, sir. I have staff has no control over right. board actions, but once so point. once we bring it to you, we consider <coughs> it complete. If that that makes sense. sense. Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Thank you, Pat, for the updates. At this time, we'll have a second public comment period. Anyone wishing to speak, please come forward at this time. 
existing. And that will close the public comment period. County administration, administrator comments? I have a request from the school board to reschedule the meeting that was a joint meeting that was scheduled for Wednesday, April 22nd at 6 p.m. to reschedule it to Monday, April 20th at 5.30 p.m. in this building. If the board, I'm looking for the board to check their calendars to see if that's okay or so if you'd regular, like to check your calendars. We have a regular scheduled meeting at night at 7 o'clock. Correct. correct. You have a regularly scheduled meeting April 20th at 7 p.m. and the joint workshop would be held between, um, at 5.30 prior to that meeting. <clears throat> and that was from which date? From the it 22nd. It was Wednesday the 22nd. That was our Isn't regular it? scheduled workshop? Yes, it was. All right. No, so, it's not a regularly scheduled workshop. On, it's a regularly scheduled meeting on April 20th. We, <clears throat> the workshop on the 22nd, we agreed oh, we to. we had a scheduled we workshop that. on the 22nd. Yeah. And the one on the 20th is already there. Okay. There were conflicts um, with the 22nd. How, so, Pat, there's on the 20th, I know it's a little crystal ball we're asking you to do, but how intense do you feel like the 20th meeting will be? Uh, we were asked item. to bring forward two <laughs> items for discussion, and the um, superintendent and I feel that those items could be covered. We were asked to bring forward the facility maintenance plan, and the school superintendent will be bringing that forward, and a discussion on the use of the middle school. So we feel that both of those could very easily be covered in the time frame between 5.30 and 7. Well, <clears throat> just speaking as a supervisor, y'all might be comfortable because y'all have got I'm sure far more knowledge about all the details associated with me, but that's a big one for me. Uh, and that was the reason I requested to have the meeting because I, I don't understand exactly how that's all, you know, going to work and what's in it. So I don't want to, you know, compress meetings if I don't have to. If we could, I would like to have that as a separate meeting. What about the 23rd? I can do the 23rd. Um, we had polled the board, and I haven't had the opportunity to school, um, poll, poll the school board on that. We won't be able to poll the school board till next week, but we could um, give that the option. We would also, if you felt, you if, okay? you, if you met on the, on the 20th and then felt that you needed more time, um, we could continue it on the 23rd. I'll tell you something. <clears throat> I'm just speaking again as one supervisor. You get diminishing returns after a certain point with meetings and the length of meetings. Like now. <laughs> Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> but seriously, I, I, I would like to have two separate meetings. And I, I'm, I can do 23. I'll even do Friday for crying out loud. You know, my, my social life isn't um, any impediment to meeting on Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays, you know. Larry, can you glance at your calendar? Do you have any? Oh, we can. It doesn't. We don't need to schedule it this evening because I do need to check with the school board yeah, on the twenty third. So we'll I we'll am. we'll send an email out to the board on on that date. I'm open to the twentieth or the twenty third. I have okay. those both free. Okay. So the are we saying that the twenty second is definitely gone? Yeah, school board. Well, that's that's, that's definitely gone. There's a conflict. It will not be held on April 22nd. And, Pat, there's two events going on? Is there that are correct? two the, events, yeah, correct. Okay. The, there's Earth Day. The Earth Day and, the and another line. Yeah, I saw the email on that. Okay. So we will not have the meeting on April 22nd. We will poll the um, board and the school board for an uh, alternative date. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. At this time, we have board comment periods. Board comments? I have one quick comment. For those of you who maybe have not seen this, uh, there, of course, there's a lot of challenging things going on in our community at all times. Mr. Norvig re uh, referenced one of those this evening for the moment of silence for the tragedy that took place in an accident. But Ms. Katrina Blankenship has, is in the hospital and she has leukemia. Uh, and so if everyone would just keep her in your thoughts, that would be quite, quite greatly appreciated. Thank you. Oh, Ruth Boatwright's husband is also in the hospital. Yeah, he's been there for quite a while. So. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Any other board comments at this time? Okay. And uh, can I get a motion to lead us in the closed meeting? Who's got the magic words? I guess we all do. They're right in front. Here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bill. 
Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll do it. Go ahead. You got uh, it. I move that we uh, go into a closed meeting pursuant to sections 2.2-3711 and 2.2-3712 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act for the purposes of one discussion and consideration of the salary of a specific public officer, appointee, or employee as authorized by Virginia Code 2.2-3711A1. And the second thing, consultation of legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such as authorized by Virginia Code 2.2-3711A7. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Tucker. We'll run to the closed meeting. Come back. I hereby reconvene the regular meeting of the Powhatan County Board of Supervisors in open meeting and request the clerk of the board to conduct a roll call vote of the supervisors. Do you certify to the best of your knowledge that only matters discussed in the closed meeting were public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting were convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting just adjourned? Mr. Williams? Aye. Mr. Nordvik? Aye. Mr. Hodge? <clears throat> absent. Mr. Melton? Aye. Mr. Tucker? Aye. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. I move that we increase the Commonwealth Attorney's salary effective April the 1st pay period by $11,700 as a supplement. Do I have a second? Second. Any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion, Mr. Chairman. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned.